Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us uh, today. I hope everyone's staying safe and healthy as with your patients during this uh, pandemic. It's really my honor and privilege to uh, really discuss uh, something that's quite passionate for myself, uh, which is cartilage lesions. And uh, I really plan to spend the evening uh, talking about some of the lessons that I've learned uh, through this journey of treating cartilage patients. Um, and share a little bit of our research uh, and kind of put it in a perspective that hopefully can resonate with many of you. Uh, goals of the talk. Uh, this is where we're going to kind of spend the evening. We're going to talk about how common uh, cartilage lesions are within the society. And then we're going to talk about some of what we've done here as we looked at sizing defects and, and how do we approach that uh, um, with our patients. And what we do, right? So one of the biggest challenges with this uh, patient population is is making the choice and what's the right choice for this patient. So we'll, we'll talk through some of the algorithm and some of the thought process uh, as we go through uh, patient selection as well. And then we'll spend the last little bit of the evening uh, with a project that we just uh, finished this last year. Uh, and uh, this was uh, presented at uh, virtually at ANA since this was, uh, unfortunately, the conference was canceled as with many things but also at the ICRS this last year. And it's really kind of dealing with what is the cost of waiting. So as we know, um, there is a generalized algorithm for how we can approach cartilage lesions with our patients. And I think this algorithm that was uh, published by Dr. Cole in 2009 is really one of the best ones out there to frame some of our thought process as far as lesion location and dealing with all the other issues that we typically need to deal with so that we can have success with any cartilage lesion. But then as we kind of get down through this algorithm, it really is kind of that nitty gritty. It's how do we make that choice uh, for our patient? And one of the things I've learned through uh, now 16 years of uh, taking, patient, taking care of cartilage patients is really is an individualized approach. There is no um, one right procedure for every patient, and you need to really consider all these aspects and come up with the uh, best choice uh, for your patient. Well, how common are cartilage defects? And it's always surprising to think um, uh, about that and, and how common this afflicts people, but on the same uh, standpoint, uh, when we think of arthritis, we know that this is a process that's ongoing. And if you look at the uh, generalized arth arthroscopic uh, papers that are out there for the general population, um, cartilage lesions are quite common. But again, these are all comers, right? So these are focal cartilage defects all the way to uh, general arthritic patients. And so you can see up to 60% of them may have a, an osteochondral lesion. Um, but the ones that I think are the, the, the ones that we typically hone in on, or especially these larger lesions where we start to think about different procedures, it's about six to seven percent of that general population. And the type of symptoms that we look for, I often uh, talk to uh, my fellows and my residents when I'm teaching them, it's really kind of two presentations. It's those acute chondral lesions. Well, those are pretty easy for each of us to uh, diagnose and uh, to think about. They have a shearing force, a big loose body that's formed, a large effusion. But actually, a lot of these are more of what I call that silent disease. And something that's slowly brewing over time and finally, we're going to start seeing some of that cartilage breakdown causing effusions. And it might be that just recurrent effusion that's the biggest issue. And one of the areas that we can see this a lot is in our athletic population. Uh, we did a systematic review back in 2010 with one of my residents, and we looked at all the athletic papers that were out there and what was the incidence of these full thickness cartilage defects in that same size region within athletes. And we found that the overall prevalence is 36%. So if you take that general population that we just talked about, somewhere around 6 to 7%, and now we're at 36%, this athletic population is obviously at an at-risk population. Um, interesting, a lot of these were asymptomatic. So again, it's that silent disease. It's slowly brewing over time uh, for a lot of these patients. One of the areas I was really interested early on in my career was uh, figuring out how can we uh, determine the size of the defect, how good are we, what's the best ways for us to look at this. And we kind of broke this down into three uh, series of uh, studies. One was looking at the MR assessment, then arthroscopically what we can do, and then what is reliable. Um, I, I love to fish. I have uh, three brothers. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, with brothers, we are quite competitive when we're out there fishing. 
And, you know, same type of thing we're looking at is, you know, how, how large a fish did you really catch? And, and, you know, that whole comparison of, you know, for our egos of who caught the biggest one for the day. Um, so, you know, just from a still picture, uh, unless uh, you look at this, it's really hard to know the size of, even of this fish. Uh, similarly, you know, once we are at time of arthroscopy, it's not always a flat surface. It's, it might be rounded. It might be uh, contoured, especially in the trochlea, and that can make things a little bit more difficult for sizing. And, and then what, what type of tool can we use so that we can reliably measure this um, again and again uh, for accuracy? So our first uh, series of papers that you can see here, three different ones looking at all three of these topics. First one was looking at the MR assessment. Um, and what we did here was all my patients who were undergoing uh, various cartilage procedures, we looked at their MRI and then we measured it in our bi in two planes so that we can kind of get what our normal size is. And why is this important? Well, this is the tool that we obviously use in the office to start making our clinical decision-making process. Uh, what is that size of lesion? What type of defect do we have here? What am I going to be uh, counseling my patient as far as the best procedure for this defect? And what we found um, uh, at this, uh, looking at the time that we of arthroscopy, we then measured it and we compared the sizes uh, from the imaging to the time of arthroscopy. And it kind of surprised us. Uh, MRI underestimated the defect area by an average of a centimeter, or about 70%. Um, and that can be a game changer. So if you think of that whole uh, algorithmic approach, if you have someone who's at that one and a half centimeters and now all of a sudden it's two and a half centimeters, well, you know, what is the best choice for that patient? Or for instance, you have a two square centimeter lesion, now that's actually potentially really a three square centimeter lesion by the time of surgery. And so um, again, 74% of our lesions in this study were underestimated by MRI. So we can't really rely on the MRI for our treatment decision only. I think that's really critical. Um, from this paper and from other stuff, I really have developed the approach that uh, you discuss with your patients, you know, um, hey, if it's a small lesion, I'm thinking of procedure A or B. But if it's a larger lesion at the time of surgery, that may not be the best option. We may not now think about uh, option C or D. Uh, to take care of this defect. And again, it allows that openness with your patients to discuss uh, the best treatment of this cartilage defect depending on what that final arthroscopic sizing uh, of the defect. So that really begged the next question, right? So, all right, well, we're not that great um, with uh, uh, measuring this on MRI. Um, well, how about the time of arthroscopy? How good are we at uh, sizing this defect? And so I, uh, I uh, enrolled all of my fellow uh, partners uh, at Ohio State to partake in this, as with some of my uh, phenomenal uh, fellows at that time, and we looked at um, how good we are. And uh, between myself and an engineer, we made all these defects, we knew the exact size of it, and then they had them all uh, scope the knee and uh, give us a uh, sizing based on, uh, as you can see here, a few different uh, methodologies. But what we found is regardless of the methodology, we all underestimated the size of the lesion. And if you really look at this scatter plot, what is truly unique and interesting about this is that we have a bias to have most of these lesions size between two and three square centimeters. I mean, we want them to fit into this microfracture box and uh, not necessarily uh, uh, but the potential uh, larger uh, lesion size where we would think about something else. Um, and, you know, uh, we took this information and I, I kind of scratched my head and I'm like, well, you know, I have a various amount of different doctors here who did this, some that were um, our fellows, some of my partners who are primarily shoulder partners at this time. Um, how good is this if we really take some of the best? The, the best cartilage people in the country are we going to see the same thing? Do we have this potential bias? And so I enrolled some of my uh, great friends uh, across the country who are cartilage leaders in this area as well, and we looked at the same thing. But this time we kind of really made this a robust study. We looked at um, reliability, uh, doing the measurements multiple different times and multiple different instruments, randomized, 
Uh, they had great patience that day because they had to scope over 80 knees uh, for this project. But what we found is, once again, we underestimated the size of the defect. And again, we were biased to these small lesions, typically under two square center centimeters, and we were very consistent across all these great experts. Um, but what also came interesting out of this is, um, what do we need to at least get a little bit more accurate, right? And, the, and it was best to use a tool. You have to have something with that kind of graduated uh, uh, hash marks in order to really accurately get the best size uh, possible uh, for, for these lesions. Uh, just our site is not really good. In fact, that's the most inaccurate. And unfortunately, um, as, as many of you, like myself, was kind of trained using kind of stepwise across with a probe, that is also pretty inaccurate. So we really want to be thinking about using some sort of graduated tool uh, to measure the defect. So when we look at this in a broad picture, what is really being done in the U.S. is very consistent with kind of this bias that I was just talking about. Uh, this uh, is just showing some data out there. This is obviously from 2017, but I mean, realistically, this hasn't changed too much. What you can see here is by far, microfracture is the most common cartilage procedure that's being done within the U.S. And I think, again, that kind of feeds into our normal bias. It's easy. It's, it's uh, at the same one procedure, uh, but again, uh, may not necessarily be the right decision uh, and the, uh, based on the sizing we just talked about. And so, um, again, where do some of these other procedures kind of fit in this uh, um, aspect? And I've done a lot of work, a lot of different publications uh, with our team here. And I can honestly tell you, I, I think there's a role for every one of these different procedures. Um, you know, it really is that patient selection and making sure you're doing the right patient selection uh, so you can have the best success possible. But there is a role for a lot of these different lesions and different procedures. Um, but it does beg this whole thing is, do all lesions need to be treated? And, and to be honest, there is some um, uh, variance in the literature. This is mostly with ACL surgery where you can see some pro and some con. Uh, uh, there's some great Shelbourne papers and, and others that have been out there that really show that you can leave these lesions alone. There's really no significant OA changes. There's no major difference in their outcomes. But yet there's other papers out there that shows that these uh, cartilage lesions, especially with ACLs, can have the poorest outcomes. And then again, depending on the treatment, you can definitely improve some of that outcome with oats, which is much better than any type of microfracture in these, this patient population. There's also really good papers out there that's showing that just a debridement at times can be a good option. Um, it's interesting that this, uh, this last study was a randomized controlled trial. Uh, it was really, really well designed. And again, they were looking at uh, mosaic plasty versus ACI, and 31% of them approved after a debridement alone never came back for another uh, procedure. Uh, if you look at even uh, Dennis Crawford's paper, uh, lesion size, again, these are pretty large lesions, three square centimeters. They had improvement just from a debridement, only 15% required further surgery. So you can see, again, debridement at times can be a good option. And, and as many of us who are in the sports realm, sometimes, again, this might be a, a temporizing thing just to get them through some other seasons. Uh, but we really are now going to kind of focus on some of more of that that patient who, who we do need to treat and uh, continues to have symptoms despite some of our best attempts uh, with uh, non-operative or other conserved measures. And again, we kind of get back towards this uh, algorithmic approach. And biggest thing is thinking about where's the location. Obviously, the femoral condyle to femoral joint are a little bit different. There are some uh, different nuances of both of these compartments and uh, potentially what you need to do. Uh, again, do we have any alignment issues, any meniscus deficiency, um, any ligament issues that need to be addressed? We really need to uh, address any of these concomitant pathologies to offer the best chance for that cartilage uh, to do well and to succeed um, uh, for the uh, patient. And then it really comes down to that lesion size. And again, accurately uh, knowing where that lesion size is. I would say in the U.S. we typically have had this cut off at about two square centimeters. Uh, some of our uh, European colleagues uh, often is at that three square centimeter. And I think that uh, uh, Dr. Cole did a great job uh, with this of kind of showing that nuances between these uh, two to three square centimeters. Then we really need to look at what is the demand of the patient. Obviously, a high demand and a low demand patient are very different. And what type of 
treatment you're potentially going to do for them will really dictate uh, what what is their goals? What's their aspirations? Um, do they want to get back towards a return to sport? Uh, are they again are low demand where it's just needing to uh, be a little bit more palliative and and decrease some of their pain? And then finally, you're going to have that choice. Um, and again, uh, uh, combining these with a potentially osteotomy, especially with a patellofemoral joint with an anterior medialization or anteriorization osteotomy, always comes up about what about staging. And, um, you know, I think a lot of times when we look at especially these uh, cell-based therapies, that's always been a, a complaint. And uh, I think for myself and a lot of us who are in the cartilage realm, uh, I think staging is actually one of the best things possible, especially as you get more complex issues with patients. Um, it, it really allows you to have a, a good view of the knee joint and for you to kind of make that decision-making process for what may be best for that patient with their goals. Uh, what I liked about this study, which was presented last year at AOSSM, was looking at um, this whole concept. You know, if you did a staging uh, arthroscopy, did it change your decision um, as far as what you would potentially want to do for that patient? And they looked at uh, the MRI for cartilage defects. And again, you can see um, not always the most accurate for uh, all these uh, cartilage defects that you may see. And then they uh, did an in-office arthroscopy. I'm sure many of you have seen these different various uh, formats that are out there for in-office arthroscopy. And what was interesting is that almost 50% of the time, it changed their treatment plan. They decided to do a different uh, treatment for that cartilage defect based on that uh, staging arthroscopy. So I really do endorse a lot of these uh, staging arthroscopies, especially um, when they are more complex, it allows me to get a good lay of the land, look at that meniscus status, uh, be able to size the defect appropriately, uh, know if I'm going to have any limitations for uh, any type of the procedures that I'm going to be doing. And I think a lot of times when you discuss that with the patients, the patients want to do whatever is best for their knee. And again, sometimes that will be all in that single stage. You'll be able to have a small lesion, you'll be able to treat it in that single stage as your plan A. But if uh, at that staging arthroscopy it is uh, larger than you think, then you can move on towards your plan B, plan C, depending on what was discussed. So I'd like to spend a little bit of time just kind of working through with this in a, uh, a patient uh, case. This was uh, a, uh, a patient that was sent to me who had a previous uh, traumatic patella dislocation roughly about a year uh, and three months prior to being seen by me, underwent a previous knee arthroscopy, loose body debridement, or excuse me, debridement and loose body removal, and it was a large loose piece. Still had continued pain, swelling since that surgery, no mechanical symptoms, has some feelings of uh, recurrent instability of the knee, but no other dislocation. As you can see from these MRI uh, in our normal kind of sizing of this is a pretty large lesion of that lateral femoral condyle. Uh, and we knew this is where the defect came off, so it was a large shearing piece that had come off the lateral femoral condyle, again, about uh, just under two centimeters wide. Uh, no major issues uh, with the uh, patella uh, from the actual dislocation. You can see a little bit of trochlear dysplasia here, but normal TTTG. At the time of our staging arthroscopy, when we looked at this, uh, you can see just the effect of that defect over time on the meniscus, you can see how it had started to abrade the uh, meniscus, basically like sandpaper on, on the meniscus over time. You can see that this is a pretty uh, large lesion encompassing a large amount of that lateral femoral condyle. Now with uh, uh, pretty much down to the subchondral plate, you can start seeing some uh, intraosseous uh, uh, lesions and um, uh, bone formation that is uh, within the lesion itself. Again, about two centimeters in width that we had and about two and a half centimeters in length uh, with our um, uh, measurement. Some unstable cartilage and again, some bone overgrowth like we just talked about. So uh, in this patient, obviously a large lesion, lateral femoral condyle, uh, it's one of those that you're looking in that algorithmic tree, highly active. Uh, where a cell-based therapy like Macy would be a really good uh, a choice for this patient. Uh, we did take a biopsy from the notch. Um, I typically, for this, will use a, uh, uh, one of these uh, large ring curettes uh, and can really easily take two tic-tac-sized pieces of cartilage from the notch. Often, 
if I'm doing a laterally based lesion, I will take that um, uh, biopsy from the medial aspect of the notch. Uh, and primarily, in, in case that lesion expands, I, I don't want that to expand or to break down uh, between my biopsy site and the actual um, uh, lesion site itself. So this is what we can see at the time of definitive arthroscopy. You can see the bony boss has only gotten worse. You can see that you have further breakdown uh, of the lesion, and even you can see more bone that is exposed at this time. Again, here's that uh, biopsy from that medial aspect of the notch that was taken. Um, at the time of uh, uh, opening up the knee, uh, typically with Macy, what's really great about this procedure in comparison to uh, ACI uh, is that we can do this now through a mini arthrotomy. Um, often uh, with that, uh, definitely can uh, prevent some of the further ex extension that we often had to uh, within the quad uh, and, and prevents a lot of that kind of quad shutdown that we would see. Um, here again, you can see the uh, bony overgrowth and you can see the overall extent of the cartilage disease of the lateral femoral condyle. This is before uh, Varicel came out with these wonderful instruments that you can use. They're kind of cookie cutters uh, where you can uh, basically tap this uh, uh, um, around the area in, in, encompassing that whole cartilage diseased area and then can use your curette to kind of make a really nice geometric shape. But prior to this, it was really kind of our old fashioned way where we take a 15 blade, uh, really demarcate the diseased versus the good cartilage, and then uh, get, restore that normal subchondral plate. Um, I hope you can appreciate in this view um, where that bony boss was, and if my uh, arrow kind of comes up here. So this is the area of all the bony boss. Um, not uncommon if you've had a large cartilage defect. Again, I think our body is just trying to accommodate for that hole that we had in there. Um, often with this, you, again, you want to remove that uh, bony boss and get it back down to the native subchondral plate, which you can see right here. Um, often that will cause a little bit of bleeding. I recommend using a high-speed burr uh, when you're doing this and just uh, very uh, gently kind of uh, restoring this uh, subchondral plate. And often with some epinephrine pledgets or a little bit of fibrin glue, uh, kind of uh, placed within the uh, crevices of the uh, cancel's bone here, you can stop that uh, bleeding. I hope you can also appreciate here that this is really um, almost non-contained in this little area of the lateral femoral condyle. Uh, one of the great things about uh, Macy, again, since it's a scaffold that we're pasting in place, um, that this really is not a problem. I think when we were doing our previous uh, techniques with an ACI, in sewing on a membrane, um, this, this was more of a challenge. We often had to place a, a suture either into the synovium on the side or potentially with uh, drill holes uh, within um, the bone. But in talking to our colleagues in part of the summit trial, they really uh, showed that uh, about half the surgeons did that, half of them did not. Um, it really did not make a difference. And you can safely, especially with this uh, minimal amount of non-containment, um, just go ahead and paste this in place like we normally do with the fibrin glue. Um, here's that final size uh, dimension that you can see. I always measure that again intraoperatively. This is where we would make a foil template again before our uh, uh, cookie cutters came out. And here's our uh, test fit of the Macy implant. And again, once we do that, we place some fibrin glue at the base. And then finally, uh, some fibrin glue around the edge. Um, so this patient obviously did extremely uh, well. She's now uh, nearly two years out from her uh, surgery, got back all to uh, the activities that she want, um, and are with a, a really good success with this uh, uh, treatment. Um, lastly, I'd like to shift gears today, uh, today and uh, this evening to talk about our uh, most recent uh, investigation, looking at, again, some of these unanswered questions that I had. So. Um, again, when we, we take a biopsy, there's multiple uh, different reasons why there can be a delay between um, your biopsy of a lesion and then uh, final implantation. And we, we wanted to look at what is that uh, potential effect. Um, and as many of you know, 
ACI uh, has been in the U.S. really since uh, the uh, 19, uh, early 1990s, mid-1990s, uh, but it wasn't until 2017 where uh, Macy uh, was then uh, um, FDA approved within the United States. And as of uh, June or July of uh, 2017, it's really been just Macy since then. Um, so this uh, uh, definitely has a mix of these type of, of uh, procedures within this study. So we were looking at that time lag again, um, which again can be several months, uh, sometimes even a year or, or beyond. And that delay can be from chondrocyte processing, uh, uh, graft preparation. Uh, for instance, if you're waiting for a meniscal transplant, if you have other concomitant issues that you're gonna to need to address. Uh, there's lots of patient factors, as many of us are aware. Um, they may be getting married, they may be getting uh, graduating from the school. There's lots of different factors that can uh, uh, factor into that to where they want to arrange it during a time that's convenient for them. And then obviously there can be some insurance approvals. And this was definitely more of an issue uh, that I had with uh, ACI. I think uh, once uh, Macy became approved and uh, with my cartilage care that's uh, uh, been used by Vericell, this has been uh, in, in very impressively successful to get insurance approval in over 85% of our patients. Um, so how does this, again, affect this uh, lesion characteristics over time for any of these various delay issues? So we looked at that. We looked at um, was there a lesion expansion? Um, was there a new lesion formation in that time frame between the biopsy and then implantation? It was a retrospective review. We looked at all of our ACI and Macy uh, cases over a 10-year period, and it was really just uh, my case as a single surgeon. Um, from the operative notes and from the arthroscopic images that were reviewed, uh, we found at the time of biopsy and time of implantation, the measurement of the defect size, which we put in uh, square centimeters, uh, the lesion characteristics, and if there was any new high-grade cartilage lesions at the second stage. And what we really mean by that is, was there a lesion that we then had to treat? Was this a new treatable lesion that we found at the second stage of uh, surgery? So our baseline assessment for any cartilage patient um, uh, is pretty similar. Obviously, in this study, we took all the demographics, the, the weight, the BMI. Uh, I also always get a smoking status. It's really critical. Uh, it does have an effect on any of these cartilage procedures, and uh, really a smoking cessation program is necessary for many of them if they're uh, uh, current smokers. Uh, knee alignment, uh, we typically will get full leg films to look at alignment if we're looking at uh, uh, any patellofemoral issues, we're really, really looking at a TTDG as well. Uh, baseline knee symptoms, um, knee injury, surgery history, and again, their activity level. Uh, when we look at our cartilage defects, uh, all of us at our institution use a, a form that we can kind of intake a lot of the uh, lesion characteristics as with other things in the knee. Uh, we'll typically will map that. Um, again, uh, based on our previous literature, I will use some sort of graduated device uh, to get as accurate as possible a measurement of the defect. Our analysis, again, was uh, using normal uh, uh, software, uh, descriptive, descriptive statistics were collected, and then a multivariate and logistic regression models were created. Well, these are results, and as you can see, most the mean age of our patient was 31, and I will say that's, that's very true for a lot of cartilage patients. We're going to see a little bit of a broad spectrum from um, some of those uh, uh, late teenage to, to collegiate years, all the way through, um, I would say, our working years in our 30s and 40s. But a lot of these cartilage lesions, again, are in these, these working years, um, especially if you put that in the light of some of that, uh, what we have already discussed with the cartilage uh, defects in, in um, people who are athletes, it may be a few years before they really become symptomatic with this when they're finally in their jobs and doing other things. A pretty even split between male and female. Uh, you can see the BMI was uh, typically under a 30 for this uh, patient cohort. Uh, pretty similar to the general population, about a 10% uh, tobacco user. Um, and then primarily involved in the weight-bearing con uh, uh, condyle, about 60%, which again is pretty common with a lot of the uh, other cartilage literature. So where were these lesions? Again, very similar to what we see with uh, other papers that have been out there. Uh, most of these are in the medial femoral condyle, if you look at a single uh, uh, area, followed by the lateral femoral condyle. 
And then the patellofemoral joint, um, if you lump them together, is actually quite a large amount of them. Um, and again, these are all the high-grade uh, um, uh, cartilage lesions at the time of biopsy. The uh, time of biopsy to um, uh, implantation, you can see here, as with the average amount of lesion expansion per month delay. Um, and he, th this was kind of surprising to me how much it uh, uh, started to increase at about a tenth of a, a centimeter per month. Um, and it, this other, uh, these last two parts, again, were uh, uh, pretty surprising to me as well. I've always wondered how many people truly are multiple defect patients from the get-go, and that was about 13.5%. But this next one was really uh, uh, kind of the, the take-home point for, for a lot of this study as well. Between these two procedures, 16% of the patients developed another uh, treatable lesion within their knee. So obviously, um, the delay is, is causing uh, uh, some further cartilage breakdown and joint health issues. Um, when we look at some of the independent predictors, uh, males, a little bit more than females, had uh, greater expansion by about a half a centimeter. The initial lesion size, if it uh, a, um, per centimeter squared increase in initial size, you had uh, 0.27 centimeter less expansion. So, um, again, if you uh, thought process on this, some of these smaller lesions actually expanded more than the larger lesions. And um, uh, again, maybe not as, uh, um, uh, I would say, uh, consistent with some of the other literature that's been out there. Sometimes we think that these smaller lesions won't expand as much, but you can see that actually they can uh, progress pretty substantially. Um, furthermore, the delay in surgery, uh, every month was basically about uh, 0.15 square centimeter in lesion expansion. Um, the other interesting part of this paper was looking at these other defects, and especially ones that you have a grade three defect and you may have a grade two defect on the tibial plateau. So a very common uh, finding that we might see. So you're doing a meniscal transplant. Uh, they may have a, a true grade three uh, a C lesion uh, on their lateral from a condyle, but you know that tibial plateau uh, cartilage has already started to uh, wear down a little bit and has a grade two change. Uh, if you have that scenario, that actually progressed the lesions more. Um, again, somewhat intuitive because again, that is uh, uh, probably uh, pushing the, this uh, lesion more in that chronic stage of almost like uh, an arthritic type of development. And you're seeing that those will progress a little bit more because the opposite surface is just not as good. Um, again, you can see that uh, per month delay in surgery and how much it would continue to increase uh, the lesion size. So where were these new high-grade lesions? Um, by far, the most common area was the patella. So again, not uncommon. You see a large cartilage defect of the trochlea. We often are going to see some of those grade two changes on the patella, some of those fissures, some of those cracks. Those lesions definitely expanded, um, especially as uh, the time period uh, was longer, where we would see more and more of the patella uh, becoming uh, an issue. Uh, but overall, patella was really one of the uh, highest areas of uh, new grade, um, high grade lesions. Again, a kind of a spattering of everywhere as well. So what are some of the conclusions from this? Well, obviously, a delay increases the lesion size. So the lesion increases by about a uh, tenth of a centimeter a month. Uh, some of those are predictors are a smaller initial lesion size. Again, you might be point loading uh, the adjacent cartilage a little bit more than the subchondral plate when things become larger. Uh, the male sex, obviously increased uh, delays to the implantation is going to increase the lesion size. Um, and the other main uh, take-on point, again, new lesions are common. We saw that the prevalence of the new lesions at implantation was 16%. Uh, and those predictors, again, a presence of a grade two lesion or increased time from biopsy to implantation. So what's, what does this mean for us? What, how can we apply this? Well, I, I think we need to counsel our patients accordingly. Um, you know, this is always difficult because, again, there's many issues that go into uh, potentially some of those delays. And uh, a lot of them are, are from patient issues. I just had a patient today who needs to have a cartilage procedure 
but you know she's now engaged and you're you're trying to uh, now figure out when is the best time uh, with her planned wedding. And so there's again lots of different reasons why we all uh, potentially need to uh, postpone or to delay that uh, type of procedure, but it allows us to counsel those patients more appropriately. I think we can realistically uh, now give them some information is, is what is the chances that they're going to uh, continue to progress, what, what can happen to their knee uh, depending on how long we have to delay. Uh, the second thing from our perspective is to be prepared for larger lesions. Um, this is, you know, really important. I, I've definitely early in my career uh, got, uh, um, uh, definitely had some challenges based on these number two and number three based on the delay. Uh, when you're thinking about a certain lesion size and especially with our old technology with uh, ACI where we had to get certain vials and that certain vials would be for a certain square centimeter area and all of a sudden you get in there and it's much larger and you're like, oh my goodness, I hope this is enough cells for that area. Uh, so that, that um, again, was a pretty big uh, take-home point for me is be prepared for these larger lesions. What's really nice now about the Macy technology is that you basically have 15 square centimeters of graft. Uh, that's a large area that you can cover uh, within the knee just from a single uh, uh, cell-based uh, um, scaffold. Uh, so that is really nice. That's given me a little bit more, I would say, comfort based on this number two point uh, but the number three point is also uh, equally valid is, is be prepared to address other new lesions. And again, this is something I, I realized early in my career. That's why I was waiting until I had enough of these uh, uh, for us to do this paper over time so that we can really uh, see how common this was and, and how much uh, uh, they were an issue. Uh, but early in my career, I was definitely surprised uh, getting into some, some knees at the time where they only had a meal from a condyle lesion. And, got in there as a large trochlear defect in the time frame from the uh, biopsy implantation. So we always need to be prepared that this may happen. Again, we see in this study that's about 16% of the patients who uh, may have this uh, second uh, treatable lesion. So what are some of our take home points uh, uh, today? Well, cartilage defects are common, but again, remember that all do not need treatment. Uh, we really need to kind of look and assess uh, all these uh, aspects with our patients as to uh, what is the best treatment and when do we want to treat them. Um, our decisions need to be based on appropriate sizing. Uh, for the algorithm and for a lot of our uh, outcomes uh, that we have uh, uh, summarized in the literature through a lot of our papers, um, size makes a difference. Um, the, the lesions that are smaller than two square centimeters are very different than the lesions that are greater than two square centimeters. And your treatment that you choose is going to have a different effect on that patient. So we really need to make these uh, decisions based on appropriate sizing and really encourage everyone to uh, uh, get a tool that you that is reliable in your hands that you can use, especially at the time of arthroscopy, uh, so that you can uh, size them as best as possible. As we discussed, the management of these cartilage defects is complex. It really does not fit into one easy box. Uh, there's not one solution that's going to be for every patient. Um, obviously, your, uh, again, low demand versus your high demand patient are very different as with their goals, their aspirations. And I really want to reiterate that not just that, but it's their ability to do the rehabilitation. It's their ability to um, be compliant. And again, what is their uh, mental uh, status? Uh, often, uh, these procedures and the rehabilitation um, can take some time. They need to have a good support system. So all these are really a lot of factors that go in towards um, what is the best treatment uh, for our patients. But I think finally, this last uh, study that we shared today is that waiting is not benign. I think, um, you know, I think a lot of times people like to kick that can down the road as much as possible, but there is a, a, a little bit of a cost benefit there, right? So as, as you wait and as you uh, progress uh, with that timing, uh, there is going to be some consequences. The lesion is going to progress, and likely you are going to have other lesions uh, that um, uh, come up. And we know, again, from a lot of the literature, especially as we get past a year to 18 months, that often the uh, uh, results can also change over time because that knee is becoming more of a chronic uh, knee uh, scenario. So with that, I want to say thank you. Um, I'm always uh, open for anyone emailing me with any uh, questions or suggestions, or if you have cases that you need to discuss, 
uh, feel free to uh, email at any time. Uh, I'm happy to uh, connect with any of you. And with that, I think we're going to, um, the host is going to uh, get us back onto our, our normal screen so I can see any other questions that come in from uh, you, any of you out there. As a reminder, you could submit questions by using the Q&A pod on your screen. Type your question in the text box at the bottom of the Q&A pod and click enter on your keyboard to submit. If you would like to ask a question over the phone, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. A confirmation tone will indicate your line is in the question queue. You may press star 2 if you would like to remove your question from the queue. And for participants using speaker equipment, it may be necessary to pick up your handset before pressing the star keys. Thank you. I, I'm, I have a question here from uh, Laura. Laura said, uh, would you treat a newly formed lesion with Macy or an alternative uh, procedure? And Laura, that um, again really depends on um, the size of the lesion. Uh, my common uh, discussion with the uh, patient, I, I look at a lot of what their activity level, uh, what their uh, goals and aspirations are, and then what is uh, that uh, uh, size of defect. I think the best treatable defect regardless are these acute ones. Um, if it's a large lesion of the meal from of the trochlea, uh, I'm really thinking of our two solutions that are uh, evidence-based at this point, not uh, some of these uh, ones that don't have much evidence are really a Macy procedure, an osteochondral allograft. And so we're looking at one of those two types of procedures. I think about what is that bone involvement um, if I need to address bone, you can do that with a sandwich technique with Macy, or again, you can use an osteochondral allograft. Um, if it's a surface lesion that's a sheer piece of cartilage, uh, then I think Macy is a really good uh, a procedure for that. And if they are over that two square centimeters, then yes, absolutely, I'm thinking about that newly formed lesion is going to uh, use uh, Macy. As far as if you're alluding to uh, the paper, and what to do with that newly formed lesion at the time of your definitive procedure, often I will use Macy for that area. Um, the nice thing again with Macy is that we have 15 square centimeters of graft uh, of scaffold that we can use, and um, it's really easy for us to uh, typically have enough uh, to do that for that lesion. Uh, Laura also asked, um, what are the typical sequences that we're using for determining lesion size? So, you know, again, at a tertiary center like I am, I see MRIs from all different types of places. So I see both the, the normal T1, T, T2 weighted. Um, we have, uh, again, some very uh, cartilage-specific sequences, uh, fat suppression ones that we typically will do here at our institution if this is our suspicion. Um, but the sizing has been done on every one of these different lesions. Uh, or different uh, types of MRIs, and honestly, we haven't had, uh, based on our analysis, any differences in accuracy between some of these uh, different sequences. And that what I say from the standard ones that you can get um, out there. Uh, Brett asked, um, why do you feel in your study the majority of patients had lesions in their tibial femoral joint, 60%, but when the new high-grade lesion was found at second stage procedure, they were most commonly in the patellofemoral joint. Um, it's a good question. I don't have a great answer for that. Uh, I, I, I don't know if that's um, due to mechanics of what is happening. Um, often uh, with cartilage patients, uh, you will find that their quadriceps uh, kind of shuts down, especially due to these effusions. And obviously, when that uh, quadricept is shut down, you're you're increasing that patellofemoral load uh, significantly. And and that's just more of a theory, I would say, of why I think that that's where they uh, potentially progress more. But um, it it's uh, something I would say is still some area that that needs further investigation as to um, why that is occurring. Um, uh, Jim asks, can you comment on how Macy has influenced or changed your rehab thoughts? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, by far, I think that uh, Macy kind of revolutionized uh, my whole thought process with uh, ACI. Um, if for many of you who are on this phone, if, if, if you had performed uh, ACI, I think 
uh, you may be like me and you really had um, some difficulty with it. And sometimes it was difficult even to uh, uh, share with your patient about how long the rehab was gonna be to recover. Um, it's really amazing with uh, some of our colleagues uh, in Australia, uh, Jay Ebert really has done some great work looking at an accelerated rehabilitation process with these scaffolds in how um, quickly we can get them back in safely, right? So um, that's the big question. You can get them back quicker, but are we doing this safely and are they gonna still have good results? And he's shown that. So the accelerated rehabilitation through uh, the use of Macy now is, is really a game changer. And you can get people back often in that same time frame that you're looking at as an osteochondrolograph uh, for, again, these simple lesions. Um, so it really has been a big issue. Again, we can do these through smaller incisions, and we had to previously with ACI where we had to make a large incision because we were sewing on a patch with a 6-0 Vicro, which no longer we have to do. So we can do this through a much more minimal approach. Eric asked, uh, what have you found to be a better instrument to measure the size of the defect? So um, there's uh, two uh, different manufacturers that we used in uh, these studies. Um, both of them were good. They both have their nuances. Uh, there is a Smith & Nephew, uh, I think it's a pliable ACL measurement tool uh, that was really popularized with the double bundle uh, thought process with uh, Freddie Fu, and it was a way that you can kind of measure the footprint of the uh, tibia. Um, it is pliable and it's nice and it really fits pretty easily through the arthroscopic portal. Um, and so that was one of the instruments that we use as with um, uh, Arthrex has a retractable graduated ruler uh, that can be used for sizing defects. Uh, they do have two that are out there, uh, one that's been um, a little bit thinner and one that is uh, um, more uh, robust like a tape. I definitely preferred the one that's more robust uh, as a tape uh, for uh, sizing this. Um, Anne asked a um, question about lesion size progression study. Do you typically wait to see if just debridement is successful? If so, in your study, how many patients did not need treatment? So uh, great question, Ann. Um, that is not something we looked at in this study. These are all people who went on towards secondary implantation um, and not the ones that uh, 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 either felt better or have chosen not to uh, proceed. Uh, we have um, looked at that uh, uh, previously more with my ACI patients uh, with a grad student um, uh, with one of my colleagues, and I believe that that is on its way to get published at some point soon. Um, and that, again, very different reasons why um, people choose not to uh, or, or if they felt better. But in this study, it was really ones who uh, def definitely went on. Um, and as far as just overall kind of thought process uh, that maybe kind of comes out of that question, um, and is really kind of who are the one, who, like how, how do you approach these type of patients? And, uh, many of us uh, in our practices will see, I, I would say, various types of patients when it comes to these cartilage lesions. And so for me, there's those patients who um, have a cartilage defect. We know that they have a cartilage defect. Uh, they may not be mentally ready, physically ready, um, a whole slew uh, of issues of ready to go from uh, uh, the initial biopsy and, and treatment to the uh, um, definitive stage. And again, some of those are the issues that we talked about. Other ones might be because they are BMI needs to come down, um, or again, they're just, they're in, in season. They just can't think about these next steps uh, uh, for uh, uh, proceeding. So that patient, often we will debris. It will kind of see how they do uh, with uh, taking the biopsy, knowing that we are probably gonna have to do this at some point down the road. Um, and then it's really kind of that close tabs uh, uh, based on their expectations of when, again, uh, from a time of their life where they might be ready to uh, proceed. Um, the other type of patient is, is those that you get into the knee, you had no clue. You had no clue that they're gonna have any type of cartilage defect. And you uh, scope their knee and you're like, oh my gosh, look at this, <laughs> look at this big lesion. Uh, and how, how, how was this not picked up on the MRI? And you, know, you kind of go through all these different thought processes. 
you know, that patient, obviously you've had no discussion with the patient what, what to do and, and, and how this may be affecting them, and obviously you're in there for a different reason. So that one I always do what I call future planning. Um, I may say, boy, we found a large lesion in your knee. Um, we're going to see how you do. Uh, obviously it's not what you came in here for, but we did some future planning. I took a biopsy. We're going to uh, uh, hold that for uh, five years, and then obviously I'm going to keep tabs on this, and if you're starting to get symptoms, we discuss what they, they might be feeling. Um, then we're going to go ahead and proceed with that next procedure. But it's really this kind of last class that it's the, the, the people that truly are those intent to treat. They come in, they are symptomatic from a defect, um, and they've been symptomatic for whatever time period. Again, some of these might be acute, but some of these might be, boy, I've been having issues off and on for six months, for a year. I can no longer run. I'm no longer playing the sports I want to. I'm getting chronic effusions. They are symptomatic. Those are my true intent to treat. Uh, we are uh, uh, there for that reason. That's the, that's the main uh, uh, pathogen that's giving them trouble. And most of them have already failed uh, these different conserved measures. So we're going there for a biopsy with that final intent to treat um, to happen. Uh, Nick asked, at what point would you uh, repeat an MRI prior to implantation to access uh, secondary lesions given the finding of your last study? Uh, good question, uh, Nick. Um, uh, often, uh, for myself at this time, if I'm looking at over a year, uh, then often I will uh, start talking about repeating the MRI, especially if new symptoms have occurred. Um, if I feel pretty confident, though, that the uh, main, uh, say, primary lesion, again, is, is like three, four square centimeters, and I have plenty of graft, then I, I, I would feel comfortable uh, foregoing that, especially if they haven't had symptoms, uh, because if it did uh, have a secondary lesion, I have plenty of graft to uh, take care of that. Um, thank you, Laura, for your uh, comment, uh, and thanks, Ann, for your comment uh, for uh, the uh, talk. And, and boy, we're, we're pretty much right on time, so if there's no uh, further questions, uh, again, I just want to say thank you for your attention this evening. Uh, I really hope that this was educational and helpful for your own practices um, and uh, where you can potentially see how Macy can fit in your practice and some of the nuances with it. Um, I do wish all of you in this pandemic that you uh, stay safe and healthy, and I, I hope that uh, your patients are as well. Um, yeah, I know it's a, a different times for all of us. Indication for use. MACI, autologous cultured chondrocytes on porcine collagen membrane, is an autologous cellularized scaffold product that is indicated for the repair of single or multiple symptomatic full thickness cartilage defects of the adult knee with or without bone involvement. MACI is intended for autologous use and must only be administered to the patient for whom it was manufactured. The implantation of MACI is to be performed via an arthrotomy to the knee joint under sterile conditions. The amount of MACI administered is dependent upon the size, surface in centimetre squared, of the cartilage defect. The implantation membrane is trimmed by the treating surgeon to the size and shape of the defect to ensure the damaged area is completely covered and implanted cell side down. Limitations of use Effectiveness of MACI in joints other than the knee has not been established. Safety and effectiveness of MACI in patients over the age of 55 years have not been established. Important safety information. MACI is contraindicated in patients with a known history of hypersensitivity to gentamicin, other aminoglycosides or products of porcine or bovine origin. MACI is also contraindicated for patients with severe osteoarthritis of the knee inflammatory arthritis, inflammatory joint disease, or uncorrected congenital blood coagulation disorders. MACI is also not indicated for use in patients who have undergone prior knee surgery in the past six months, excluding surgery to procure a biopsy or a concomitant procedure to prepare the knee for a MACI implant. MACI is contraindicated in patients who are unable to follow a physician-prescribed post-surgical rehabilitation programme. The safety of MACI in patients with malignancy in the area of cartilage biopsy or implant is unknown. Expansion of present malignant or dysplastic cells during the culturing process or implantation is possible. Patients undergoing procedures associated with MACI are not routinely tested for transmissible infectious diseases. 
A cartilage biopsy and Macy implant may carry the risk of transmitting infectious diseases to healthcare providers handling the tissue. Universal precautions should be employed when handling the biopsy samples and the Macy product. Final sterility test results are not available at the time of shipping. In the case of positive sterility results, healthcare provider or providers will be contacted. To create a favourable environment for healing, concomitant pathologies that include meniscal pathology, cruciate ligament instability and joint misalignment must be addressed prior to or concurrent with the implantation of Macy. Local treatment guidelines regarding the use of thromboprophylaxis and antibiotic prophylaxis around orthopaedic surgery should be followed. Use in patients with local inflammations or active infections in the bone, joint and surrounding soft tissue should be temporarily deferred until documented recovery. The Macy implant is not recommended during pregnancy. For implantations post-pregnancy, the safety of breastfeeding to infant has not been determined. Use of Macy in paediatric patients younger than 18 years of age or patients over 65 years of age has not been established. The most frequently occurring adverse reactions reported for Macy greater than 5% were arthralgia, tendonitis, back pain, joint swelling and joint effusion. Serious adverse reactions reported for Macy were arthralgia, cartilage injury, meniscus injury, treatment failure and osteoarthritis. For more information or to view full prescribing information, please go to macy.com.